There is a small island where pelicans once inhabited. The island was desolate and surrounded by cold ocean waters from the Pacific. Native Americans claimed the island was cursed. But of course, the white man wouldn't listen. Europeans would settle and place artillery pieces there. The first duty of this floating rock was warfare. The rock's most notable use would not fall in the domain of the military, however but in a punishment of criminals. Society's worst outlaws, career bank robbers, murderers, and rapists would all spend the worst years of their lives there. An island of hate, where the worst come to receive the worst. If Walls could speak, the stories they would tell about this island prison would be chilling. But who would listen? Society placed them there precisely not to hear their plight. This was an island of hate. A place where your sole job was to suffer. This is the story of Alcatraz. Alcatraz is located 1.2 miles from the shores of San Francisco, California. Getting to the island is actually easy. A ferry from Pier 33 can get you to Alcatraz in just 15 minutes. The island has a length of roughly 1,700 feet, a width of 600 feet, and is 135 feet at its highest point. This gives a total area of 22 acres, so the island is not large by any means. Alcatraz is the number one most famous prison in the United States, and arguably the world. More commonly known as The Rock, it has been featured in Hollywood movies, newspapers, and mainstream media in general. Considering how notorious the prison is, you may be surprised to discover that Alcatraz only operated for 29 years. Despite this very short lifespan, Alcatraz's notoriety is still renowned. There are many reasons for this, which we'll get into later in the episode. But for now, let's take a look at how it all started. Alcatraz was discovered by Spanish naval officer Juan Manuel during his discovery of San Francisco in 1775. He named it the Island of Pelicans because of the pelican birds that inhabited it. Following the acquisition of California into the United States after the Mexican-American War, the United States Army Corps of Engineers began fortifying the rock. This would continue until 1858, when Fort Alcatraz was complete. During the American Civil War, Fort Alcatraz was used to imprison Confederates caught on the West Coast, as well as their sympathizers. Other prisoners of war shoved into Alcatraz were Native Americans who resisted captivity and life on reservations. This included Apache leader Geronimo. Native Americans who also refused to send their children to Indian boarding schools for Western assimilation were also sent to Alcatraz. By 1900, it was clear that Alcatraz's career was to be a military prison. So in 1909, Major Reuben Turner ordered the construction of a huge concrete cell block to house prisoners. This cell block would become the island's most dominant feature to this day. During World War I, Alcatraz was used to imprison conscientious objectors. One person that stands out in particular is Philip Grosser, a man that refused to fight in the army during World War I. He was sent to Alcatraz and exposed to all sorts of torture. He was dragged around on a rope, chained up and beaten, denied toilet calls, and much more. Grosser described the horrible experiences in his book, Alcatraz, Uncle Sam's Devil Island. Link is in the description. Anyway, in 1933, the Department of Justice designated Alcatraz as a federal prison. It wouldn't be a normal federal prison, however. Alcatraz would hold prisoners that caused trouble at other federal prisons. 
a place to hold the worst of the worst, so to say. By 1934, the island was transferred from the military to the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Of those 137 men that arrived at Alcatraz, 83 had life sentences. Some of them had double life sentences. Others had terms that were in many sense even worse. Alcatraz's first warden was James A. Johnston, a man said to be made of iron due to his strict discipline. There were no plans for rehabilitation, just a place of hate and suffering. So what was the day like at Alcatraz? Well, let's find out. Like most prisons, Alcatraz had adopted the New York system, which basically means labor and long periods of silent reflection. A day at Alcatraz went like this. 6.30 a.m. Morning whistle. Prisoners arise, make beds, clean toilet bowls, and place all articles in prescribed order on a shelf. 6.50 a.m. Second morning whistle. The prisoners stand by the door facing out during which the lieutenants make the count. 7 a.m. Third whistle is blown, and inmates move forward into the mess hall. 7.30 a.m. Work starts. Inmates are tasked with hard labor, an industrial complex I've already covered in a Sing Sing Prison episode. 11.30 a.m. Prisoners stop work and assemble in front of their shops. Another count is taken by the work foreman or the guard. 11.40 a.m. Prisoners go to the mess hall for their second meal of the day. Noon. Another prisoner count is taken. 12.30 p.m. Shop details are again formed and prisoners go back to work. 4.15 p.m. Work stopped. Another count is taken. 4.25 p.m. Prisoners are marched into the mess hall for dinner. 4.45 p.m. Prisoners go back to their cell. 4.50 p.m. Final lockup. 8 p.m. Another count is taking. This time, prisoners are inside the cell. 9.30 p.m. Lights out. The list I've just gone over is by no means exhaustive. Many steps were skipped for the sake of time and to prevent sounding redundant. But to summarize, the day is punctuated by whistles. The prisoners are counted a total of 13 times each day, and every action is done under the muzzle of a gun. Prisoners are only to work, and speaking is entirely forbidden. Failure to follow these strict rules will land you a physical punishment or solitary confinement where you are kept in a tiny dark room with no bed and fed only bread and water. This miserable routine is enough to make anyone go insane as you can imagine. As a result, a total of 36 prisoners tried to escape. 23 were caught alive. 6 were shot and killed during their attempt. 2 drowned. And 5 are listed as missing, thus presumed drowned. To this day, Alcatraz claimed that no prisoner successfully escaped. The cold water and strong currents are simply too hard to overcome. This assumption was proving false, however, in 1962. A prisoner named John Paul Scott escaped Alcatraz, successfully swimming to the shore of San Francisco. Upon reaching the beach, however, his body was so shocked from hypothermia that he fell unconscious. He was taken to Letterman General Hospital and sent back to Alcatraz after recovery. Although recaptured, Scott proved that it was indeed possible to escape Alcatraz by swimming. There were many big faces that went through Alcatraz. Al Capone spent time on the island. So did Machine Gun Kelly. The godfather of Harlem, Big Bumpy Johnson, spent time on Alcatraz. So did James Joseph Bilger Jr., aka Whitey. As a side note, Whitey was one of the human subjects for the CIA-sponsored MK Ultra program. Whitey was told by agents that the goal of the experiment was to help find a cure for schizophrenia. This was a lie. The true aim was to research mind control drugs for the CIA. Whitey recalled his experiences under MK Ultra as nightmarish and quote, took me to the death of insanity, end quote. The most notable incident in Alcatraz's short lifespan would be on May 2nd, 1946, when six prisoners attempted to escape by violently taking over the D-block section. This would be known as the Battle of Alcatraz. By the way, 
On a cultural note, D Block is the section of a prison that houses the worst inmates. Many rappers refer to it in their music, some even unofficially calling their rap group by this name. Anyway, what started as an escape attempt degenerated into a full shootout between prisoners and guards. Two guards were killed, and 14 were badly wounded. The captain of Alcatraz was shot twice in the stomach and chest. Another prison guard was shot in the face below the left eye. Yet still, another prison guard was shot in the nose, etc. The Battle of Alcatraz was outright ugly. James Johnson, the warden of Alcatraz, called on a naval station at Treasure Island for help. As a response, the Navy sent two Marine Corps platoon to get the situation under control. After a heavy shootout, the Marines drilled a hole on the ceiling where they suspected the main instigators to be located and dropped a hand grenade. The prisoners leading the assault were found dead once the troops dropped in from above. In an odd twist of faith, the prisoners got their wish. When the escape attempt failed, the prisoners leading the assault said to each other, Let's go out first class. First class. First class. First class. First class. The Battle of Alcatraz awakened the public to the nightmare the island really was. Here was a place where the worst of society go to become full monsters. The very opposite of what prisons was meant to do. A place of rehabilitation. The miserable conditions of Alcatraz brought out the worst in people, and a volcano finally erupted through the Battle of Alcatraz. Not only was Alcatraz not effective in rehabilitating prisoners, but it was very expensive, costing significantly more money than other prisons, about $100 per day per prisoners when adjusted for inflation. The liberal public of San Francisco had had enough of Alcatraz. The prison was closed in 1963. One year after Frank Morris and the England brothers made their successful escape, further shattering the myth of Alcatraz being inescapable. The spoon proves mightier than the bars and supposedly escape-proof Alcatraz prison. Three bank robbers serving long terms scratched their way through grills covering an air vent, climbed a drainage pipe, and disappeared from the forbidding rock in San Francisco Bay. It appears to be the first successful escape in the history of the maximum security prison, and the flight is attributed by Warden Olin Blackwell to the deteriorating condition of the prison, crumbling concrete and eroding metals, with five million needed for repairs. Americans have a weird fascination with crime and punishment. We watch crime and prison shows to get an idea of that world from a distance, but our curiosity stops there. This leads to strange perceptions of the criminal community, seeing them as either victims or devils, neither being entirely true of course. Experience with the underworld has shown me that there are generally two kinds of people in that community, those who were forced into it by necessity and others who feel a gravitational pull towards crimes. Misfits, so to say. How a society treats its misfits provide a good clue as to where it's at in its evolution. Depending on how we treat them, misfits will either move us up or drag us down. See you next time.